comments on the Bethlehem star, even if it is planets. Well, let me read you something. A different type of Christmas story. The Christmas narrative is one of the most well-known stories in the world. Every year on December 25th, hundreds of millions of people around the world celebrate some people celebrate Christmas in honor of Christ's birth, some have no religious association with it and follow the Santa Claus tradition. And others simply view Christmas as an opportunity to connect with family and enjoy some time off. No matter why you celebrate, you, you've at the very least heard of the Christmas story and its connection to the birth of Jesus. There are so many different decorations and recognizable items that are connected to this holiday. Everyone has either had or at least seen a Christmas tree. Christmas wreaths adorn front doors. There are lights on the roof and around the windows. Candy canes and gingerbread houses. After reading this, some of you are wishing it were Christmas right now. Will it be in a few days? For all the Christmas traditions and items that exist, there are two that stand out above the rest and they will have our focus the first is the star of Bethlehem, Bethlehem, and the second is the manger scene. As a kid, you probably never questioned or even wondered what the star of Bethlehem was. Who cared, right? Christmas morning, oh by the way, what you'll see in the night skies, right now taking place is not the Bethlehem star or what they call the Bethlehem star. Let's continue. As a kid you probably never questioned or even wondered what the Bethlehem star was. Who cared, right? Christmas morning was coming and that meant presents. But as we get older we want to know and understand what we believe and why we believe it. I don't want to believe in something just because it has existed for a long time, especially if it's wrong or inaccurate. I want the truth. I want to know the truth because truth and the truth alone is what sets us free. There have been a myriad of attempts to explain what the Star of Bethlehem may have actually been. What could have been so extraordinary that it would cause people from faraway land to come and investigate? One idea that has been put forth is that it was a supernova, a star exploding at the end of its life cycle. The explosion is very bright and can last for days or even weeks. This would definitely garner the attention of astronomers. While it's a very good theory, there is no supernova on record during 3 BC. Now, I'm skipping along in this author's work, which he already stated he believed that 3 BC was the date of Christ's birth, or the years. Another working theory is that it could have been a comet traveling through the solar system. Again, that would explain the presence of a bright moving object in the sky that could last for days at a time. But we face the same problem. There is no comet on record for 3 BC. Another less likely scenario is what some refer to as a supernatural occurrence. That God created a star especially for the birth of Jesus. Is this possible? Of course it is. After all, we're talking about the God of creation here. But it doesn't seem to be in line with how God has worked in the past. The scripture goes as far as to say that he never changes, that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
What we often see in scripture is that God uses the natural world that he created for his purposes. We see this in action during the ten plagues of Egypt. He used natural means to create a supernatural experience. God did the same thing with the parting of the Red Sea. He used wind and water to make a dry path for the people to walk through. So while it's possible that God created a special star just the night of Jesus' birth, Biblical history pushes us towards the more likely conclusion that he used what was already there. Let's remind ourselves of what Matthew 21 verse 1 through 2 verse 2 says exactly happened that evening. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, the, during the time of, the, of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? Now that happened not at the time that Jesus was born. I believe up to two years after. But that's another something that I think I've already covered before, if memory serves me right. If I didn't, somebody will tell me and maybe I will in the future. Maybe next Christmas. Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. The star referred to this in, pas in this passage was part of a series of celestial events over a period of several months. Magi, who and what were they? How many of them were there and, were there, and where did they come from? The most important question is why did they come? We'll get to that. But first, let's learn a little bit about the infamous travelers from the East and their role in history. In English, we call them the Magi. This comes from the ancient Greek word magos, M-A-G-O-S. According to Strong's Concordance, the word is Greek, the word is Greek number G3097, and is the name given by the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, Medes, Persians, and others to the wise man. Teachers, priests, physicians, astrologers, seers, interpreters of dreams, soothsayers, sorcerers, etc. Given that this particular group of men were following a star, they were most likely astrologers, which in ancient times didn't mean what it means today. Astrologers then were people who observed and studied the movement of celestial objects. The better term, and the one I use for them, is astronomers from the East. I have a close friend in Israel who served as my guide tour, my, my tour guide since 2004. His knowledge of the land and culture is staggering, and his wit with, with and sarcasm regarding biblical characters is hilarious. I may call them Magi astronomers, but he humorously refers to them as the not so wise men from the East, because the Magi decided to tell King Herod of their mission to find the newborn king of the Jews. Once again, he wasn't just a newborn. The danger of this statement is lost if you don't know the background behind the king, Herod of the New Testament. During his reign as king, Herod grew increasingly violent and paranoid. He had his favorite wife, murdered on the suspicion of conspiring against him. He also had several of his family members killed because he suspected they wanted usurp him. History records him as an absolute madman toward the end of his days. Enter the wise men, or the not so wise men. Herod, who has killed and murdered anyone in his way, now hears that a new king has been recently born. Without Herod's historical background, his actions in slaughtering all the boys two years of age and under in Bethlehem may seem extreme or shocking. But we understand that his actions were consistent with his narcissistic behavior throughout his entire reign. As the title Magi implies, they came from the Arabian Peninsula, likely from either Persia or Babylon. There's some believe they came from Areas of Persia identified in those days as Elam, actually. 
before those days. The art of tracking celestial activity was quite common in these cultures, where they were very much aware of heavenly signs and their significance. The idea of astronomically, astronomical activity and conjunctions with the birth of or death of an important person was prevalent among these cultures. As we will see, the Magi were tracking a spatial phenomenon so intriguing that it caught their attention, and they risked the long and treacherous journey to Judea. Notice what they said to Herod in Matthew 2.2, 2, that they had seen his star, not a star. They might not seem, that, that might not seem significant, but there was a huge difference. Some skeptics have discounted the Bethlehem star story right from the get-go because of the fact that the Magi said they were following a star. Astronomically speaking, that's not entirely correct. If you recall from an earlier, if you recall earlier, we spoke about the fact that stars are fixed objects in space. They don't move, we do. So if that's the case, then how was it that the Magi were following a star? In order for them to follow it, the implication is that the star was in motion. So some have said that the accuracy and integrity of the passage is not to be trusted. Nonsense. They were following a moving object. They called it a star because at that time they were unaware of the planets. The word planet comes from the Greek plantis, P-L-A-N-T-E-S, -E which means wanderer, and a planet often referred to as a wandering star. The ancients understood only two types of stars, fixed and moving. So when the Magi talked about following a the star, they were absolutely correct in the description. The wandering star they were tracking in the sky was the planet Jupiter. That's right, the king planet. It should come as no surprise to us that God would use Jupiter, the king of kings, to herald the birth of the real king of kings, Jesus. Now, I didn't read you this part, but I'll continue reading this part to you here now. Early in this chapter, we listed the celestial activities of Revelation 12, and we covered that before. We talked about the sun passing through Virgo, the moon at its feet, the crown of 12 stars, and the meteor shower emanating from Draco's tail from September 10th through the 12th and 3 BC. Remember those dates. September 10th through the 12th, 3 B.C. They're about to become really important. We know from Revelation 12 that the constellations of Virgo and Draco were involved in the birth story. Now we'll add one more. The constellation, constellation, constellation of Leo, the royal and kingly constellation. Again, it should come as no surprise that is involved in marking the birth of the King of Kings. Between September 10th and 12th, a planetary movement called the retrograde occurred. Retrograde is the apparent reverse motion of a planet on its course. This occurs because of the orbital position of the Earth and the planet in retrograde. It actually looks like the planet is moving on its course as it normally does. Then it slows down and eventually stops, then appears to go backwards on its orbital course for a bit. It will look like it's slowing down and stopping again, and then it will reverse into its normal speed and direction. From our position on Earth, the retrograde path of the planet appears that it is moving in circular motion and is sometimes referred to as a halo or crowning effect. I want to read that one more time. From our position on Earth, the retrograde path of the planet appears that it's moving in a circular motion and is sometimes referred to as a hailing or a crowning effect. Retrograde motion is not rare or unusual. In fact, Mercury goes into retrograde 
two or th three times a year. So why would this retrograde capture the attention of the Magi? Because of the frequency of the retrograde and the fact the planet was Jupiter. To give, give, give you a better understanding how you perceive this when you look up into the heavens. The retrogression effect. When you're looking towards the southern horizon. You see, see it come across the horizon and there's kind of a loop. Well, let me do it lower so you can see my pen. Comes across, comes across, comes across, then it does a loop. And then it goes back in the direction it started. That's the retrograde or the retrogression. And of course, in this time period that we're talking about, that's what the Magi were observing in the night sky. The retrogression coming across the sky, doing its loop, and coming back, coming back again, or going back again to its destination, original destination. The reason the Magi followed Jupiter retrograde was such fervor because not only did it rotate once or twice, but it also went into retrograde three times in an eighth month period. So let's do this again. So it comes across, does this loop, keeps going, gets to a certain point, does another loop, and it keeps going. Then it comes to another point, does another loop, and it keeps going. That's what's unique about this, in this time period. Not just one retrograde, but three times in this retrogression process. It occurred. Got it? Three times in an eight month period. An eight month period. This is definitely not normal. As Jupiter usually goes into retrograde once a year. Remember how we spoke about God taking what already existed and using it for supernatural purposes? This is a perfect example of that. That's why when I be, before I began, or maybe when I began reading this to you tonight, everybody's observing the night skies right now in 2020, December 21st, 2020, and the alignment of planets and think, well, that could be the possible Bethlehem star. Nope. No can do. That's not what the mad guy was observing. And unless you dig into all these details of different astronomical viewpoints and you really dig in to the different viewpoints, by the way, of people that follow the heavens, observe it with a biblical perspective and break it down and see what possibly could line up with God's Word. It takes a little bit of time. It takes some effort. It's not reading one article and you're done or reading one book and you're done. And once again, once you have that possible biblical reference, what this is referring to, then you try to match it up what we see in the secular world in the science world and see we could match up the events. Is the evidence there for what I just explained to you? Absolutely. Let's continue. Where was I? A planet can go into retrograde anywhere in our sky. It usually will perform its circle in an open space, meaning it doesn't circle any particular star or constellation. It's still quite impressive to watch and observe. What made the retrograde of Jupiter so interesting to the Magi 
was not only did it did it three times, but also that it didn't do it merely in open space. Now, Jupiter, not it, not just because it did it once, but it did it three times. But something else, Jupiter circled or crowned one star and one star only. I want to read that to you again so I could put this to rest, at least for this year, why it's not this or that. Because it seems like every year we come up with different stories or reinterpretation of stories that have been told of, or theories. That was the Bethlehem star. What made, made the retrograde of Jupiter so interesting to the MAGA was not only did it did it three times, but also that it, did, that it didn't do it merely in open space. Jupiter circled or crowned one star and one star only. The star is, it, it crowned is called Regulus, R-E-G-U-L-U-S, R-E-G-U-L-U-S, and it's found in a constellation of Leo. But wait, it gets better. Regulus is Latin and means little king. Let's piece this all together. The king planet Jupiter went into retrograde three times in eight months and crowned Regulus, the little king, in Leo, the constellation of the king. You're starting to pick up the king theme here? It's no wonder the Magi told Herod they had seen his star and asked where the king had been born. They have never been to Judea. They had never been to Judea. They most likely had never read the Hebrew Bible. Maybe, maybe not. But they were convinced that the heavens were revealing to them that a mighty king had been born. That's why they made the journey. That's why they risked it all. They knew that this was a once-in-a-lifetime occurrence. Once-in-a-lifetime occurrence. So the Bethlehem star was not just a star. It involved the star of Regulus, but it was so much more. It was an incredible combination of events. No one of the Magi came from so far to see, see such an incredible event. They hit the celestial jackpot. Remember the September 10th through 12, 3 PC window we spoke of? It's coming back, coming back again. The first time Jupiter went into retrograde and crowned Regulus was on September 11th, 3 BC. I'm sure they sent the Magi packing, but then only five months later on February 17th, 2 BC, it did it again. Jupiter crowned Regulus for a second time. I wonder if it was at that point that the Magi, with bags packed, decided to head for Israel. And three months after the second retrograde, it did it for a third time on May 8th, 2 BC. I don't know about you, but there is no way that I could chalk this up to chance. This has intelligent design written all over it. This was intentional. This was on purpose, and it was for a purpose, to mark the birth of the most important person in the history of all mankind. The king planet crowned the kingly star in the kingly constellation to mark the birth of the king of kings. That's how our creator God marked the birth of his son. I don't know about you, but that is more than enough to convince me of a September 11, 3 BC birth date for Jesus. But as usual, there is more. September 11th is a date marked by more modern calendar. September late ah, September 11th is a date marked by a more modern calendar than the one used in the time of the Bible. The 12-month calendar we use today did not exist at the time of the Magi. So what calendar they used? They used a biblical calendar that was centered around a lunar orbit. 
Our calendar is solar and runs for approximately 365 days, while the biblical calendar, calendar tracks the moon's orbit and runs for approximately 360 days. That's why Christian and Jewish holidays are seldom on the same day. Our calendars are very different. Since the ancient calendar uses the moon to track and establish its days, it's no surprise that a new moon at the beginning of the first biblical month sets up the entire calendar year. The first month of the Hebrew calendar is called Tishri, T-I-S-H-R-I, -I, where a new year occurs on January 1st, the biblical calendar starts on Tishri 1, which generally falls on our calendar in mid to late September. That's a very important date. Today, Tishri 1 is the Jewish New Year. But in ancient times, it was known as the first day of the Feast of the Trumpets. When two witnesses confirmed the sighting of the new moon, it marked the beginning of the ancient Jewish calendar year. Then the rest of the year fell into place, and special ceremonies and joyous festivities took place that night. Yom Teruah, first word Y-O-M, for the people that have to transcribe this, second word is T-E-R-U-A-H. Translates into the Day of Trumpets into English, in part because of what took place. Jewish tradition tells us the ram's horn, known as a shofar, was to be blown 100 times at the outset of Tishri 1. Can you imagine the sound? 100 trumpet blasts resonating throughout the city. Sounding the trumpet served various purposes. We're told in the Bible that the sounding of a trumpet can signal an alarm of war. It can also be called to assemble the people or even command to march. It was also used to either announce or coronate a new king. We see an example of this in 1 Kings 134. There have Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him king over Israel. Blow the trumpet and shout. Long live King Solomon. In this biblical example, we see a connection being established between the blowing of the trumpets and the coronation or installment of a new king. You might be wondering why in the world we're reviewing Jewish history in a book that's supposed to be about the constellations. Here's why. Virgo was in the sky with the sun in her womb and the moon at her feet while wearing a crown of 12 stars on September 11th, 3 BC. The dragon's tail went through a meteor shower from September 10th through the 12th and peaked on September 11th, 3 BC. Jupiter, the king planet, crowned Regulus, the little king, and Leo, the constellation of the king, on, wait for it, September 11th, 3 B.C. September 11th, 3 B.C. was Tishri 1 on the Jewish biblical calendar and ushered in Yan Terhua, the Feast of Trumpets. The night Jesus was born on Tishri 1, as the nation of Israel was celebrating the star of a new year and blowing the trumpet a hundred times at a time that would be culturally appropriate to announce a new king, Jesus, the Son of God and the King of Kings, was born at the very time on that very night. That's how God announced the arrival of His Son. Hopefully that explains to you what the Magi was seeing in the heavens, in the night skies. So when all these other theories come around, and all these different explanations, discard that. This is what was happening. 
This is what Magi saw. To announce the King of Kings arrival. There's one other interesting story that came up recently concerning Boots or Bootis, depending how you want to pronounce it. B O O T E S. The title of this article is Mystery, Mysterious Radio Signal Detected from Exoplanet in Deep Space. Of course, this is not a religious article. Could give new way to examine alien worlds. Mystery radio signal detected. A group of researchers believe they have detected radio bursts that originated in the constellation Bootis. To date, more than 4,500 exoplanets have been discovered as scientists explore the universe to better understand it and perhaps signs of life. Despite that, they never found a radio emission emanating from any of these faraway planets. Until now. A group of researchers believe they have detected radio bursts that originated in the constellation Buddhas, according to the study published in the scientific journal Astronomy and Astrophysics. It goes on to say, we present one of the first hints of detecting an exoplanet in the radio realm. The study lead author, Cornell University researcher Jack Turner, said in a statement, the signal that was from the Buddha system, which contains a binary star and an exoplanet, we make the case for emission by the planet itself. In the strength and polarization of the radio signal in the planet's magnetic field, it is compatible with theoretical predictions. This system, Buddha's, or Boot's system, is approximately 51 light years from Earth. A light year which measures distance to space is approximately 6 trillion miles. 51 light years, so you got around what? 300 trillion miles away? The researchers made their discovery thanks to a low frequency array, or a LOFAR, a radio telescope in the Netherlands. After observing the radio emissions from Jupiter and looking at more than 100 hours of worth of radio observations that were scaled to mimic the gas giant, they discovered the so called hot Jupiter signature albeit a weak one, in this star system. We learn from our own Jupiter what, what this kind of a detection looks like. We went searching for it and we found it. Isn't that kind of ironic? After I just what, what I read to you. In addition to possible radio emission, they originated in the constellation Boots. They may have also found other radio emissions, including the constellation Cancer. But that's still questionable. The study co-author said if researchers are able to confirm the radio emissions are indeed coming from the constellation Boots, it could open a new window on exoplanets, giving us a novel way to exa examine alien worlds that are tens of light years away. And remember, They never found any radio emissions emanating from anywhere, anywhere from these faraway planets, until now. And where is this coming from? See, I don't think any of this is a coincidence, folks. Boots, or Buddhists. What does Boots mean? I've covered this before. It means the coming one. The coming one. Located in the sign of Virgo. To me, what this is illustrating is the announcement once again in a different way. 
And more needs to be revealed about what these physicists and astronomers actually have in their hands as evidence. But it illustrates the coming of our Savior. That announcement's once again being declared. I don't know if you remember what Buddhist looks like, but he has a sickle in one hand, a spear in another hand, looks like a man in the constellation. And the interpretation of that is that he shall thread on the winepress of the wrath of God and cleanse the earth of all evil and establish his rule, his kingship of righteousness. I think it's just one of many announcements that we're going to see. And I've never said this before, and I'll get to it in the last day's teaching. I believe Jesus will return on Tishri 1, the first day of the Feast of the Trumpets. Now, which day? The first day. This part I never share with you. My personal belief a future September 11th. Think about that. That should give you something to think about over the Christmas holidays. Nothing is a coincidence. 2,000 years ago or today, he is returning. He's making his announcements, first through his word, than anything else that he's created. That the King of Kings is coming. And he's coming soon. Now I want to hear from you. Play this song.